anonymous donation. No comment, but thank you for that generous donation. And with that, we're ready for Shovel Knight, King of Cards. Take it away. Am I live? Yes. No. Hi, everyone. This is Shovel Knight, King of Cards. We're going to be doing a nice little song and dance number. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's more to the game to that. So this is it. The final... Uh, <laughs> The final campaign of Shovel Knight. Uh, we've been waiting a long time for this one, but I'm really excited to show it off. So uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like my couch to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Munchie uh, Koopas. Oh, I'm sorry, David, I cut you off. My bad. Moo Moo, go no, ahead. I wanted to start with you. <laughs> Whatever. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Moo Moo. Hi, Moo Moo. And Muncha. Howdy. <laughs> All right, uh, before we get started on this, uh, I had donation incentives for both the armor color and the name of the file. So armor color first, which one won? Purple and gold. Yay. Okay. I'm All sorry, right, so I think you mispronounced that. I, I think it's... <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make do with it. All right. <laughs> And then we've also got the file name, which I will input immediately. And I believe Hamtero was winning last time I checked. Is it Hamtero? That is correct. That is a is very that really? good name. Is yeah. that how you spell Hamtero? Oh, oh, that's the kanji up there. Oh, I thought that you, I, I was like, wow, that's really fast, David. Yeah, no, it's Hamtero, tarot cards. You know, king of cards. Hi, I, I have a special guest commentator here. This is my four-year-old, he woke up. Okay, but, uh, do, do you two want to talk about the run before we get started? Sure. Uh, David? I guess we'll just mention really quick, um, just super quick. Uh, I'm a runner of the, the game in, in general, but Muncha worked on the game. Yeah, I worked on uh, QA, and I also did the design of the card puzzles in the card houses. I'm very sorry, everyone, for all the frustration. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you also ran those. this game at, uh, was it PAX? Uh, yeah, I've done a bunch of Shovel Knight stuff over the years, but I'm excited to see someone else take the reins and, you know, show off, show off what they've got. Sweet, that's me. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and count this down now. So uh, three, two, one, go. All right, so for the starts of this run, we're gonna just talk about uh, King's basic movement. He rolls and goes everywhere. His basic, like the only thing you can really do is bash, but you can roll out of that. And so that's his primary form of attacking and moving around. And anytime he bashes into an enemy or a specific type of wall, uh, he'll enter a spin motion. This uh, pirouette is sort of like Shovel Knight's pogo in that you can bounce off of enemies and it counts as an attack afterwards. Yeah, something to note is that uh... While King Knight is bouncing, uh, he cannot do his bash again in the air until after he has bounced off of something with a spin. Um, so if you use your bash in the air, you don't get it back until you bounce off of something with a spin or until you take damage. There's also the roll, which as you can see allows David to roll through certain objects and terrain. It deals one damage, and against some enemies that only have one health or one health remaining, you can roll through them. I'm going to go ahead and stress that Movement with King, um, from a casual perspective, is very fun, and you kind of, you know, you play around. It's it's super enjoyable. From a speedrunning perspective, it is incredibly difficult to just move through rooms without bonking and losing time. You run a high risk of not getting your bash into a wall because you just misjudge the distance, so you'll fall to your death. You can get knocked out uh, into pits as well. So if David just manages to make it through a room without dying, that's a good reason enough to clap. Yeah, and it's also the reason I'm letting these two do most of the commentary, because I'm not good enough at this game to uh, do all this complicated movement and talk at the same time. So for starters, as far as uh, things that David's going to pick up throughout the run, uh, he's going to be needing a lot of gold and some merit medals. The merit medals act as a currency to unlock sub-weapons for King Knight. We're only going to get one of those later on, and then we're also using the gold to unlock an ability for King Knight in the form of armor. Uh, and both of which are pretty tightly routed.
There's actually quite a bit of extra golden world one that makes it a little safe. Yeah, yeah. From from a standpoint of if you're just getting into the run, you're just kind of learning the game, you can totally pick up extra gold. There's safety, safety everything. Uh, you can pick up safety health from hi mom, hi mom, bye mom. <laughs> Who? Oh, right. Hi mom, bye mom. Yeah, that was, I'm always uh, so thrown off by how fast that is. <laughs> but yeah, these are very short stages. Um, Specifically, unlike the other King Knight or the other Shovel Knight uh, campaigns, instead of doing a boss at the end of every stage, this took a lot more inspiration from Super Mario World. So you see very short action stages without a boss and a very prominent gimmick, uh, and then you have a boss stage like this one. So at the end of this level, uh, David's going to be fighting against Spectre Knight. I'm sorry, I had to remind you. Uh, that's at the end of this level. That's several rooms away. I ain't thinking about that now. <laughs> Got the next room coming up. <laughs> uh, Spectre Knight behaves a lot like a player character, and so Spectre's AI is not really predictable by the runners. You can certainly do a lot to combat Spectre Knight, but for the most part, it's not a consistent fight. In fact, uh, the TAS actually did not help us find a consistent fight. The TAS had to rely on finding a specific RNG seed just to do this fight. <laughs> Ideally, what David would like to do is this, which is chain rolls back and forth uh, as Lion keeps Spectre in the corner. Uh, due to Spectre's somewhat, you know, wonky personality, he can choose to jump away at any time. He'll choose to climb walls for like 30 seconds at a time. But luckily, I would say Spectre is very. I would say Spectre is very lifelike, but I don't feel like that fits here. Well, he's dead. He's uh, a I got a bone to pick with him. I suppose you also yeah, want to yeah, roll yes, for initiative. Yes, I'm a dad. I'm going to make those jokes. Oh, right. We got a deck of cards. Uh, so King of Cards is totally about getting a bunch of cards and beating a bunch of people in a children's card game. Uh, and that's how we become a king. Um, please, David, show us how to play Justice. OK, you guys are not ready for the skip that I'm about to do. Brilliant, there it beautiful, is. amazing. <laughs> Flawless execution, frame perfect everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can actually beat the entire game without playing cards a single time. Note that the only rule in the uh, King of Cards competition is that you have to beat the Joustus judges. It says nothing about beating them in a card game. Um, the actual story to this game is that King Knight is on a journey to become king. He doesn't care how, he doesn't care what the title is, he just wants to be a king. So he hears about the King of Cards competition and sets out to do his best. Whatever that may mean for King Knight. You could almost say it's a noble ambition. On this level, they introduce the springs, which as soon as King Knight touches uh, them will send him into the spinning motion. And they do have collision on the side, so you can actually bonk into them or initiate a spin off of them by bashing into them. Now David will be taking a secret exit. There's lots of secret exits littered throughout uh, each world. And this one specifically unlocks the path to the level that gets him the item he wants for the run. More on that This in a one bit. also specifically gives me a lot of anxiety. It's a pretty difficult one. Like, I think of all the beginning stages, that's the one that scares me the most. I would agree. Even in, more than Spectre. In testing that stage, I would always try to go super fast over those springs, and I would always inevitably fall in the pit and be very sad. So in this level, we are using the merit medals we collected in order to unlock uh, an armor. And the curse of these levels that, that you pick up these heirlooms is that you can't bash. So in order to move around and kind of try and move fast anyway, uh, the heirloom that we got, the turncoat, allows you to roll. And you're basically protected from all forms of damage while you're doing this roll. In fact, if you were to take damage, you would sit absorb it and you can release very powerful flames. So this weapon's a great movement tool and really good at damaging enemies. Yeah, you may have noticed David was able to extend his jump a couple of times in some of those rooms. And that's due to the fact that when you activate the turncoat, it itself allows you to move left or right uh, in the air. And due to, like, when you do that during a certain portion or startup of your jump, it basically combines both of those distances in a layman's terms. So, David, you're totally going to be going for uh, frame perfect turncoats, right? The what? I never practiced that. <laughs> So uh, what I'm talking about is there's a small little trick just to show how ridiculous the run can be from a technical level. If you use an heirloom, and there's a couple of them that do this as well, the moment you pogo through dirt, you'll actually cancel the spin and bounce animation, and you just fall straight through it, which is a very minor time save, and it's obviously not something you really want to go for, but hey, it's a thing. 
What David's doing on that checkpoint, uh, apart from breaking it, the act of bashing like that is actually very useful for combat because King Knight's normal way of fighting is actually not very fast, but if you can bash Pogo and bash off of something, which is not easy to do, you can actually deal a consistent amount of damage with it. It's actually not too bad whatsoever. Um, and that's gonna be kind of important for this boss coming up. It's normally not easy at all to deal damage to King Primor because giant shoulders prevent you from bashing directly onto his face, and his face is the only part that you can actually deal damage to. So David's going to be using the turncoat to try and get into the hitbox, and then using well-spaced bashes to try and deal double damage on the way up. Yeah! And then finish with a level three flame. Oh. Oh! I messed up the end there, but... Uh Oh well. Dude, you still got most of it. That was really good. The hard part's the beginning. Yeah. Like, finishing that fight's not too hard. I just kind of uh, got too eager. That's uh, a thing in general with this game as far as like dealing damage to enemies is th there's a beautiful grace that Yacht Club put into the game where if you are ever dealing damage to an enemy, there's like a small, maybe like two frame window where they can't deal contact damage to you. So being aggressive in this game when you do have to fight is rewarded. And speaking of rewards, go claim your eternal reward. And I don't mean <laughs> the, Jaf the Jafar one, I mean the Brigandine. I menued slowly there because I really did not want to mismenu and spend all my money on something that I can't use. Oh, that would have been really bad. Yeah. The, the... I mean, I haven't messed it up before, but better not start now. <laughs> Yeah, the, the reason David quit out to the title screen there is uh, it serves several purposes. One, King Knight doesn't have to exit the ship normally. And two, it actually skips uh, a small cut scene on the map where it shows the path unveiling and some other stuff happening. So overall, it saves, I don't know, roughly 10 seconds, probably more. Um, and there's various points in the game where you do that. Now you're seeing him use the turn code uh, in combination with the battery brigandine, the armor he purchased. Uh, the battery brigandine allows you to charge up a bash similar to how Plague Knight can charge a burst. Uh, you can dash in four directions, up, down, left, or right, and you can also use the turn coat uh, during that bash to extend your height. Um, and so you can jump super high in the air. And what this actually does is it essentially cues up the turn coat to activate as you come out of the bash. So you effectively combine both distances. And even though you're dashing up, it's still reading the left or right input as King moving left or right. It, it's weird, but the point is uh, this gets you a lot of height and lets you skip some stuff. Yeah, One thing that actually... can really throw you off that is that Battery Brigadine's uh, charge time is slightly longer than uh, Plague Knight's first. So if you're used to running Plague of Shadows, but then you try to use Battery Brigandine, then uh, you're gonna miss that charge a lot. I hate to burst your bubble, it's actually exactly the same. But it feels You're longer. kidding me! It, what? It definitely feels it, it longer! It is exactly the same. I... Mm, I want to disagree so hard! <laughs> Okay, so Dave is going through a terrifying section here with one of our favorite, uh, oh god! Uh, I'm fine. Powerful enemies. Uh, Don't get smooched! I'm fine. You're okay. <laughs> okay, You're I'm fine, fine. I'm fine. Masterful. Things didn't go to plan, but I didn't die. If this, any... this is a scary game sometimes. Like, you have all the movement You're not even up. in the scary levels, now you're going to them! No, pressure plant's easy. Oh, right! This is that thing I was gonna bully you about. <laughs> okay, so I truly respect the safety that David's going for, uh, but I did have to bully him at least once for one thing that I kind of wanted to see in this one. But I totally understand why he wouldn't want to risk anything because it's super easy to die <laughs> as King Knight. Ooh, I'm blind. He is grabbing this checkpoint, and that's good because uh, the, the last portion of this and this stage is very easy to die in. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, King Knight is really, really punishing. Um, stages only have one checkpoint most of the time. They, it's, a, it's an exception that they have to. And uh, most deaths will cost you half a minute, if not. Oh, you're going for it! Oh! Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> what, the quirk? My heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go for that. D did you mean the tougher version? I thought you were gonna bully me about the oh, tougher the version. No, 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 no. I was going to bully you about something in, in the halfway point of that level. The end of the room... So when I watched your... your, I was doing practice commentary on your other run, and you didn't do that ending. 
I messed up. You. I messed up Go the David. setup. And the PB. Oh, okay. So you. Oh. <laughs> nice use of turn code to uh, avoid taking damage. Yeah. Oh yeah, this stage. So uh, if David. Oh, I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> This level's rough. I remember. Oh, <laughs> wait! <laughs> nice save, no, dude. Mr. Saving. Reaper. Nice save. I, I remember one day I came into the office and they asked me, hey, you play this level real quick. What do you think? I'm like, why is there so much fire? There wasn't fire here yesterday. <laughs> Uh, so what I was trying not to jinx David about was uh, if he fell down that pit He would have had to have quit the level because not only would it have resulted in him not getting the secret exit Which is a very fun looking secret exit, you know, uh, but also he would have had to have done an auto scroller Very long auto scroller My dad Well now it's time, for, it's time for fish level It's time for boat skip no. <laughs> God bless. Uh, shout outs to Carter Freak, who um, I met him through the Mega Man 11 community, and uh, he started playing this game. And he found this crazy, crazy trick where you can use the turn code to skip having to use um, a boat in, in part way through this. Uh, it's not easy in the slightest. Um, no runner with a sane brain goes for it. But it is really cool. In fact, uh, Carter was the one who found the brigandine interaction with the turncoat. So we actually call them uh, Carter jumps as well. But yeah, this boat, Muncha, <laughs> how do you feel about this boat? This boat gives me nightmares. It caused so many problems. It's okay, they're fixed now. All right, so we do have an auto scroller. Um, this is a great time for a donation. Uh. All right, we have a $25 donation from jmiz119. Are the commentators not going to talk about how sweet David's kids are being in the background? Mad props to him for running this game and parenting at the same time. You got another one. We have a $25 donation from Dance Dad. Dance Dad is enjoying the run, but he's also enjoying Cuperson in the back. Shout outs to the teddy bear. Let's put this money towards another <laughs> cute game. Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Keep on grooving all and stay safe. Yo, shout outs from one dad to another. I like it. All right, so this fight is going to go by really fast because, as we mentioned earlier, the turncoat is super powerful. Uh, fully charged flames from the turncoat will deal three hearts of damage. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, which translates to six, roughly. Each boss has 20 health total. Ah, oh, I missed it. That's okay. Oh, man. That's okay. So what David was going for was uh, if you can get another charge flame, that you can kind of push the boat over to the right side before the fight actually finishes, uh, which is something really cool that David found. Um, it's faster because this cutscene ends, or like the fate to black starts when, um, when King Knight leaves the screen. But yeah, again, shout outs to Carter for finding that because that was also a really ridiculous, uh, that kind of cemented, oh yeah, turncoat's probably the route. Oh mm, boy. Three. My favorite Time levels. Time to be terrified. <laughs> I'm actually serious, the Clockwork Tower levels were some of my favorites in the King of Cards campaign. Oh, I love these, absolutely, but uh, you also run the risk of dying, like, all the time. That's normal for Clockwork Tower. Anyway, the main mechanic in these levels are these pistons. And it's when you bash into them or stand on them, they will lower or raise respectively. So a lot of the puzzles are based around figuring out what pistons to hit to uh, make them move in various places. So I remember I asked you last night, how come it's possible to bash into the wrong sides of them and do that? Because you bashed them. And technicality prevails. You are technically correct. The best kind of correct. So the two Clockwork Tower levels are straight in a row, and Shock Assembly is probably by far one of the most hated from the runners. Uh, <laughs> this is because of these things. Whenever you roll or land on them at all, they send out a bolt. Uh, enemies can also force that bolt to come out. I think it's actually just the robot specifically that can do it. 
Hmm. I suppose there aren't really other enemies. Okay. Well, yeah, there aren't really other enemies that walk around. Ooh, huh. that was a nice bash into turncoat. I had not considered that. That was also very risky. Well done. It was? It looked risky to me. <laughs> it's not easy, that's for sure. I can attest to that. Uh, one thing that I will bring up briefly is that um, anytime David wants to use the turncoat, uh, he has to use Vigor, which is his mana, and it's six Vigor in order to use the turncoat. So if David ever messes up one of these tricks, he may not have the mana that he needs in order to be able to do a trick later on. So he does have to be very conscious of that. Nice. Of what? <laughs> Yo, what, uh, nothing's going wrong here. Everything's fine. It is fine, and that's is why we're so next? impressed. Cyclone is next. Okay, so we're going to have to have a huge quiet time at the end of Cyclone, but I'm going to... Um, explain something that's really important to this game. And that's how rooms work. Whenever you enter a room, most of the objects in that room are loaded. So the tornadoes, the enemies, um, enemies are kind of weird, but also like bricks and stuff, and the goal ring. Uh, so, so long as um, David performs certain actions, he can totally interact with a lot of stuff that's in the room, even if he's not visibly on the screen. And that means that uh, because the last section of this stage is an auto-scroller with tornadoes, and it happens to be with the goal ring, uh, you're intended to just kind of chill and wait it out. Um, but David can actually navigate it blind, so I'm going to shut up so he can do that because it requires a lot yeah, of Yeah, I'm at keys. the checkpoint now. Easy every time. Clap! <laughs> uh, I tried doing that so many times during testing and eventually I was just like, ah, oh, forget it. Someone will figure it out. <laughs> oh, so this is a neat stage. Um, it's actually, this is a flying machine stage, sort of, but it's also got assets from the Burger Bluff level. Uh, well, can you tell us about that, Muncha? Uh, essentially, when they were making the levels uh, for World 3, uh, they wanted to try and include a bunch of different ideas and effectively when they were trying to make a third flying machine and third uh, birder stage uh, they simply decided that it would be best to combine the best ideas from both levels into one level and so we get this one and it has a lot of interesting things it introduces i think it introduces the blubber meanie the blade scale this lovely wind mechanic this room's yeah, fun if you this is actually going. one of my favorite levels it's also got two checkpoints in it, which I feel might be related to the fact that it was once two levels. Yeah, this Ooh, is one of the nice. longer ones. Ooh. Fun fact, if you roll as David did, uh, you don't spawn the enemy that appears in that room. Nice little time save. Uh, because rat movement is random, this room is actually kind of really terrifying. Yeah, the wind doesn't help. Ooh, oh, I like the turncoat use. Oh yeah, another fun fact about turncoat, if you use it during a bash, uh, it immediately cancels your horizontal momentum and will force you to, like, descend. So in certain cases like that, it just helps you reach the goal ring faster. Alright, so this Spectre rematch is like the first one in that it's like a player-controlled fight, um, but if Spectre gets under 4 health, he's gonna start healing. So David actually has to try and do this fight. I'm gonna shut up so he can do that. First try! Holy moly. That skips an entire second phase of the fight. Oh, you got the nice kill where you're still... Nice! And you yeah. got the lightning! <laughs> yes! I got this during testing and I was like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> So yeah, uh, if David did not deal like four hearts of damage in the last two seconds of the fight, uh, Spectre would have healed back to full health. And now we get, again, a love the-
Yes. Boss, we're gonna get something cool. Yeah! Oh, man. Nope. Okay. Whoa! I'm fine. All right. Oh, no! Got, got a little off the rails there, but, uh, yeah. Okay, I thought you were gonna... Yeah, well, once you get that beginning, the rest of the fight, you kind of have to improvise every time. I really... Or maybe there's a specific quick kill that I haven't learned. I don't know, King. The boss's movements are erratic enough. <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Jacob and James will... So now, uh, Dick... Dick... Um... <laughs> so Which one? For me? Um, gives the most anxiety. Yeah, it's war prep. Uh, everyone, everyone agrees it's war prep overall. Uh, but Munch and I were debating whether or not. <laughs> Munch and I were like, uh, I, I like, I like Tower Two. He's like, I like Tower One. It's hey, okay, both of us hate Tower Three. I would say not as enjoyable, but still fun. Yeah, that's okay though, that's part of the fun, is the challenge. I always try to find a way to uh, skip this portion of the spikes and get up there early, but it never worked out. No, I'm not going under the platform. <laughs> you were gonna rip me, weren't you? <laughs> no, but I'm certainly thinking it loudly. <laughs> Team social distancing, no hug for Clary. <laughs> Did we lose Moo Moo? I think we lost Moo Moo. It's okay, I'm here. <laughs> this is Tower 2. This level is called, I believe it's called the Lava Well. You'll find out why in a little bit. Uh, this actually introduces the new blue samurai enemy, which just spins around Oops. in circles and uh -oh. is very annoying. Oh no, you win. It's okay, you have charge bash. I'm fine. It's okay, you were ABC, always be charging. Here David tries to space his turncoat so that it kills all the enemies in his path. Usually that second and third blue samurai are a bit hard to kill. Whoa, nice. Hit the checkpoint for safety. This room can be quite the challenge, as not only are these worms moving you in various directions, combined with all the fire and the falling lava droplets, but there's also this blade scale. Excellent job avoiding him. Now we get to do some skating. Shoutouts to Tony Hawk. Oh, that's on the schedule later, isn't it? I believe so. Ooh, good timing on that jump at the uh, Samurai Archer, or Liquid Archer. Yeah, I, I actually had a visual cue for that jump. I, I instinctively reached over to split, but I'm not running live split right now. <laughs> I should love how that works. I used to do that all the time at the office. I'd finish a level and like reach over for my keyboard and be like, wait, I don't need to do that here. <laughs> so in this level, uh, when David touches the top or bottom of the screen or anywhere that this uh, green warp wrap mechanic is introduced, um, he will go from one side of the screen to the other. Also, as you have seen, he's not dying to the spikes. That's because using the turncoat uh, gives you a brief period of invincibility to spikes. I believe it's mostly used in this level. Have I mentioned how useful turncoat is? It's incredibly useful. Here, we're gonna skip jumping through that room. Well done. Ooh, good jump over that arrow. I would always Ooh. get hit by that. And I'm gonna grab this checkpoint for safety. The, the right. auto-scroll is not that dangerous anymore, but I still have a tendency to mess it up. Yeah, this auto-scroller is very long. It's designed to kind of take advantage of what is the quintessential thing you do as King Knight. You jump, you bash, and you land. So it's all about 
making a cool vertical, you know, puzzle around all those mechanics. This is uh, another good point to drop off a donation since uh, we're just about done with the run. All right, we have a $25 donation from Kate38. David, hello from iGamer. Even when you're focusing, we can hear the dad jokes in our hearts. Donation <laughs> goes to Runner's Choice. Thanks, Kate. I appreciate it. Got time for another. All right, we have a $250 donation from Milk Parrot. Great job, David. Your coworkers are cheering you on. Shovels up. You know, I, I, I'm slightly tense because I don't know if you're going to go for something. Oh, no. Uh, I am not going to go for the mm. fast cycle on here. Um, I mess it up too often. I'm just going to take this I don't this like safe. that you did that. Well, I got a swag. I just got to take it safe while I swag. I forget when the ladder actually loads in. That's like one of the exceptions, I think. I have a visual cue for it, but that visual cue is no good if I go for the slow block. Uh, so ladders are not one of those things that are not grabbable, even though they load um, or whatever. But uh, the task does that entire auto scroller not only blind, but does the that you can go through the gap. It's a one tile gap. <laughs> so one day someone might be that insane. Uh, yes, so as we're coming up on the end, um, we're, David's going to be doing uh, three more boss fights here, but we also got introduced to another gimmick at the last stage, which is these uh, Oops. blocks that are coming up. Space these, blocks. Uh, slightly more purple ones. Space blocks. Space blocks. Uh, oh yeah, the moon level that was, that was going to happen. <laughs> Uh, so these blocks essentially um, make it so that King Knight has to deal with Spectre's um, limit limitations. Uh, whenever Spectre Knight jumps off of a block, they are destroyed. Uh, and so that makes this fight very much like the Spectre Knight one, but David has turn code and battery brigandine and can do bash pogo bashes, so he might get a lot of damage on the enchantress here. Good so far. Oof. Her angles were not very uh, kind today. Yeah, but I killed her mm, before she dove again. Good finish though. So I'm satisfied enough with yeah, that. Yeah, getting under the floor again would have been. She's easy to finish so off. So now we've betrayed all our friends. No, we haven't done that yet. Oh yes, uh, we sorry, are sorry, spoilers. <laughs> Uh, so for this, these last two fights are very, very specific in how you're supposed to execute them. Um, most items don't work on them. Uh, so David's actually going to be using the Battery Brigandine in a way that's very, very difficult. He has to constantly do charge bashes and stay in the air almost the entire time. And then he gets to perform a really funny glitch that he did. <laughs> Time will be on the last hit of the second phase. Oops. It's pretty easy to lose that uh, charge while doing this. Yeah, it's. A, I don't know if it's frame perfect, but like to in order to get this chained properly, it is darn near close. I gotta right, go now. So My what planet needs me. <laughs> what David's about to do is uh, he found this weird glitch where if you never land on the hands again after the this fight starts, um, the boss forgets how to do the rest of the fight. Time. <laughs> GG. <laughs> Was that Ian, swaggy enough for an ending? Ian, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I love this. <laughs> All right, I actually was not running a local timer, but that did feel like a pretty good time. Probably sub 32. What was my time? Oh, it looks like 31. Hold on. Waiting for my TV to catch up. 31.30. That is very good. Jesus. Very What's the world record? 131.23? Yeah, the world record's 31.23. Holy moly. 
think that's a good enough run for GDQ, don't you? That was amazing. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Huzzah! No friends! <laughs> but king is oh, king. Right, uh, we betrayed everyone we know and love. Uh, the end, bad ending. I'm no longer baby, only want power. Is, is there anything interesting I should look at in the credits? Uh, yes, my name. No, I'm kidding. Um... <clears throat> oh, I think that's pretty You're interesting. Right, right, my name. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, there you are. I see There you. I am. Cameron Moore. You can't use my slow name on the air. Oh, right. Anyone I'm looking for in here? Aha, there you are, Moo Moo. I see you. You can't escape me. Right next to Mint Potion! Yeah! Right next to Mint Potion! That's awesome! And zero deaths. That never happens. It just did? That's actually insane. Well, okay, it happened, but it never happens. Uh, that's it. The end, everyone. So, uh, do you two have any shout-outs you want to give? I do not, but I would like to offer a shout-out to you for doing so well on this run. <laughs> Seriously, that was Yay. really amazing. And thank you for inviting I, me. I had fun. Thanks so much for being here. This is a lot easier when uh, when I have you two on commentary and I can just focus on playing the game. It's hard to talk and run. Yeah, I had a, I had a blast being on commentary with you guys. And uh, I will say, um, if you are interested in this game, the community is always really welcome. There's a ton of guides and resources, so if you want to play, Come and join us, uh, all four characters, many categories, in fact, categories that are not known to man because we do all kinds of cheat code runs too, like four times bigger enemies or players and super crazy wonky things. Trust me, this game never ends. And if you like the card game, there are actually categories that play the card game. Go on, do it. And showdown. All right, thank you so much, David, for that awesome run of Shovel Knight King of Cards. We have a couple of donations. RJB129 with $250. King of Cards was my favorite expansion to my favorite platformer. It's great watching it broken wide open. Good luck, David. We also have a $100 donation from Asa. Yes, David, master of puns and speed runs. I'm so excited to see that not only are you returning to GDQ, but the kids are having their GDQ debut too. Go team, David. Thanks so much for that donation. And with that, SGDQ 2020 Online will be right back after this ad break.
wrapped in snuggles. Starting things off right, here's to a great week at home watching speed runs. Thanks to everyone for making it happen. We have a $50 donation from Seska Ivins. Little do you know, you've joined me on my birthday. Thank you to GDQ for all you do. You're all amazing, and I hope SGDQ continues the amazing trend. Well, happy birthday. We're going to go to a quick ad, but don't go anywhere just yet. We'll be back in just a moment for an interview with Doctors Without Borders and more speed run fun. We are speedrunners. Speedrunners complete games in record time through great skill and perseverance. We're speed responders. When an emergency strikes, we don't wait. We assess the needs and we act fast. From complex zones like Syria to natural disasters like the Nepal earthquake and disease outbreaks like Ebola, we rely on independent funding like your donations to help us stay neutral and impartial. Now we can keep the momentum going with Summer Games done quick. Donations will empower Doctors Without Borders and make an immediate impact on work we're doing in more than 60 countries worldwide. Doctors Without Borders and Games Done Quick like to get things done fast. So give now by clicking on the button below and together we can set a new fundraising record. Thank you for your generosity. Welcome everybody to a fantastic interview that we have here for Summer Games Done Quick 2020 online. My name is Jeff or uh, Jay Hobbs, as I'm often known here, but I am joined by a very special guest from Doctors Without Borders. We have the Executive Director of US Operations. We have Avril Benoit. Avril, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jay Hobbs. Uh, how are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Uh, the stress has not fully hit me yet because we are pre-recording this, <laughs> so it's yeah. not we're not quite at the uh, the live moment of the broadcast yet, where <laughs> where things can go wrong. So I, I'm looking forward to what I'm going to see here and what uh, everybody at home is already watching right now. Okay, so I'm projecting ahead. Everything's going great, fantastic, <laughs> everybody. You're winning. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yes, great. we've probably already set several records, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to remind everybody what we are here for, what Summer Games Done Quick is all about, and that is we uh, raising money for fantastic charities like Doctors Without Borders. And I just want to get to know you, Avril, as well, and, and get to uh, let the viewers get to know you and let them know kind of what you do with um, Doctors Without Borders. So what is it that you do with Doctors Without Borders as executive director? The executive director is uh, the leader of the organization in the U.S., uh, and we're a global organization. We are fully international with operations in more than 70 countries, and offices like ours that are really supporting those operations with resources, uh, financial, people, uh, talent, expertise, uh, different units, and so forth. So that's what we do here in the U.S. Our uh, U.S. headquarters are in New York City. And the executive director is essentially in charge of that. And the other thing to know about us is we are an international humanitarian aid organization, quite a, quite a colossus in, in the space of you know, conflict zones, um, countries that are very low income or perhaps uh, at risk, uh, governance issues, maybe their public health systems have completely collapsed uh, in, in different kinds of crises. And we are specialists um, uh, for going in and supporting uh, the provision of free health care for people who are really caught in the most vulnerable situations you can imagine. My colleagues uh, are all over the world, so on any given team, you'll have nine out of ten of us are actually from the country uh, where we're doing the operations. 
And, um, you know, the rest are international and it's not just American. It can be uh, on any given team. You could have a mix of, of people from all over Africa, all over Asia, the Middle East, all mixing together just to lend our extra support um, and be in solidarity with, uh, with the local colleagues who are doing their best um, to, to be able to save lives above all and alleviate suffering through the provision of medical care. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit more about you. How did you actually get started with um, MSF? Because you've been working with MSF for, I think, 14 years now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was a journalist before. That was my my career. And at a certain point, I got tired of being an observer and chronicler and uh, Mm -hmm. telling the stories uh, and and thought, huh, can I can I actually be somebody who helps? (laughs) Normally, you you are even if you have a bit of an activist soul or the kind of person who would want to, you know, drop the camera or drop the the notepad and just jump in and help. um, You can't you have to you have to capture the story and and stay out of it and be extremely neutral. And at a certain point, um, it just felt right to really lend my skills. Uh, The skills that I had at the time were communications, so that's how I kind of got into it. And this speaks to something important um, that might be of interest uh, to the gamers and the fans today, is that although our name is Doctors Without Borders, we actually employ all manner of people, uh, all kinds of skill sets. Um, So when we're recruiting aid workers, we might also need nurses. We might also need uh, laboratory technicians, but uh, we need human resources and finance and logistics. That's that's a heavy one just to to be able to to help us construct the hospitals on the fly, uh, to be able to move the supplies from here to there. So there are all these different roles, um, including communications, which is able to support one of the things that we feel is so, so key to our identity, and that is bearing witness, so speaking out. And of course, that's kind of what SGDQ is all about in terms of people who want to do more, don't necessarily know how uh, coming together. And what you can do today is is donate. Gamesdonequick.com slash donate is the where you can find the link. Of course, it's below the stream as well. Obviously, we're in the middle of a pand- pandemic right now, but things haven't necessarily changed around the world. Like people still need help everywhere on the kinds of things that are, that are happening even when we're not in a pandemic. How has the, you know, current atmosphere of the world kind of changed your mission or maybe even how, not your mission rather, but changed your responses or maybe in what, if it's more interesting, what ways has it not changed things? Um, how have you kind of felt the difference in a, a day in 2020? <laughs> oh, it's changed things. Mm-hmm. It's changed things because, first of all, like everywhere, we had to to really buckle down on PPE, the the kind of personal protective equipment that makes it possible for our medical people to be safe working in environments where patients are coming in potentially with COVID-19. Once your staff starts getting sick, uh, then you're in real trouble. Um, And so the 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 scramble the kind of wild west that we know about from many countries like the US uh, was going on pretty much everywhere. And there was hoarding and there was price gouging and a lot of complicated things were coming into play that made it much more costly for us even to to equip our teams um, to be able to deal with the pandemic if if there were to be a surge uh, in in the country where they had projects. Um, And in some countries it it hasn't um, come up as, uh, you know, with the kind of force of impact in our hospital wards as we expected. So we got ready and we transitioned mm-hmm. everything. And then you're waiting for the, you know, these COVID-19 patients that don't necessarily come or you get a few or you have some suspected cases. And a lot of countries don't have the testing capacity. But for us also, it was the, you know, just that that great unknown. Where is it going to go next? Right now we see um, that there's a huge need in Brazil. So we've got medical teams working in different parts of Brazil, but particularly in the Amazon. And we would choose a place like that because these are communities um, that are usually overlooked by the national government, where there's not much political interest Mm -hmm. in their survival. Um, You know, in the Amazon, these are the indigenous people who are protecting the forest and there's a whole connection with climate change and deforestation and whatnot. And they're often uh, not cared for 
um, in the in the health structures that exist. And so that's where we have an added value to go and reinforce teams, medical people that are on the ground already, maybe working for public clinics and so forth, um, just to boost up their capacity. And once we feel that we're at, they're at the level, then we can move on somewhere else and uh, help reinforce the capacity elsewhere. So it's been a rewarding time to be in a medical humanitarian mm-hmm. organization, but extremely stressful. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. I think you know, every, everyone at home, we're, we're dealing with just 1% of, of that effect. And it's already overwhelming to, to all of us out there. So thank you again to you and everyone else who's been working tirelessly throughout this uh, to just try to continue to, to help people. I, I think. Well, thank you. You're part amazing. of it. We're all in it together. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we, we call ourselves uh, Doctors Without Borders, you know, is known internationally as Médecins Sans Frontières, mm-hmm. which uh, is the direct translation in French. And we're a movement. You know, it's, it's an association of people that includes our supporters and it includes the gamers here today. So we're, we're very thankful uh, that you're supporting us. Yeah, I, and we love to do it. So I, I guess the kind of last question I, I had for you is just if you had any kind of stories, any moments that you remember from your time at MSF, could be recent, could be from 10 years ago, <laughs> It's so easy to to forget sometimes when we donate to charities that it's it's real people working at these charities and people who are having experiences for years. And so I always love to hear about those experiences. Yeah, I, there there are many many uh, stories that uh, that come to my mind. Uh, but one I'll, I'll tell you about. I was mm-hmm. a project coordinator, so I went from communications then into more general management of operations. Um, before making my way to be the executive director uh, here at uh, Doctors Without Borders. And in South Sudan, as a project coordinator, uh, when I first took over the team, it was at the beginning of um, the really the, the spread of a conflict in, in 2014. And we had a reduced team because you want to make sure if you're in a very remote location with no road access, because there are all this all these warring parties, whether it's the the army of the government or the opposition groups, it was too dangerous um, to even imagine that if things got hot, we could escape by road. Um, So we needed to reduce the team, uh, the international uh, mobile team, uh, who were also nationals but, but recruited elsewhere, the people we would have to evacuate to a very small group that could fit on the plane. And, um, Eventually, we were able to build up the team again. Things seemed kind of calm, but it all fell apart over the course of a few days when there was an armed group that was going around picking off aid workers who were from an ethnic group that they considered to be their enemy. So we actually decided, okay, we have to reduce the team again, but we will stay. Other aid organizations decided to fully pull out of the the region, to fully evacuate. So everything else stopped in terms of other activities. Um, And so we were able to maintain this skeleton team, but it was still very scary to get that first group out because the plane was a tiny plane, you know, that normally would carry maybe 10 people and we stuffed 12 onto that plane. And as it was taking off on this, you know, bumpy dirt runway, like an an airstrip, not Mm -hmm. a proper you know, the kind of airstrip where there are goats that you have to shoo (laughs) off when the plane is landing and taking off. Um, The plane, you know, was, was heavy. And I was watching thinking I'm responsible for all these people. And they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, uh, is it gonna make it but finally we had had an aeronautics engineer do the math and figure that it was doable as long as nobody carried any luggage, like one spare pair of underwear. And that was it. So we got everybody out safely. (laughs) And what was what was extraordinary is that for the next six weeks, that the remaining skeleton team was on the ground running the hospital in a refugee camp for 50,000 people as the only service they had left. Um, we decided to, to really integrate the community. So we would walk to the project every day and say hi to people like we're still here. And, and the, that made a bond with that community uh, that was so integral to the ongoing trust and even protection of our medical team because they didn't want to lose us. 
you know, the last thing they wanted is for us to ever get attacked or be in trouble or anything like that. So the word would kind of go out. These are good guys. Look after them. Make sure they're OK. <laughs> and, and that way we could we could continue to run. Uh, you know, the maternity that was delivering babies all day and dealing with malnutrition and do all these things. And the community was so close with us during that moment, sharing information. We were sharing back that that it was one of those moments where you really, you stand back, you know, at night and you say, that was a day where I had no doubt that we are needed here. That that's a day when this team is just rocking it incredibly long hours, fraction of the staff you would normally have, still the same burden of patients in terms of numbers, a commitment that really, you know, attaches you to one another, to the community, and also to the organization where you just start to think, man, you know, I'm in the right place. Mm -hmm. If I ever wanted meaningful work, this is it. Um, it you know, and it's uh, many years later, I'm still here, you know, <laughs> despite despite these dramatic moments, you you feel fully alive, fully useful, using your skills um, and contributing to alleviating suffering, which is a uh, you know something that, in some levels, is kind of selfish, you know, because you get something out of it as well from the giving mm -hmm. of yourself. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's what I I would tell you as as the kind of thing that happens, and it explains the loyalty many of us have for the organization. Wow, that that is such an incredible story, a powerful one indeed. And I, I just, the, that's the exact kinds of moments I love to hear from everybody that's that's working over at Doctors Without Borders. Uh, sure. Avril, thank you very much for talking with me. Uh, again, everyone, Avril Benoit from Doctors Without Borders, the executive director of the US team. Uh, we thank you so much for everything you've done and everything that Doctors Without Borders has done. Now I want to throw it back to the hosts so they can bring us to our next speed run. Thanks, Jay Ops. Thank you very much. Two with the Packle. We have a $250 donation from Dirk.